So as you know, we are hosted by the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. So today we're going to have Sarah Sweeney speak to us about open educational resources. Sarah is our project coordinator here at CORAL and she's been working with CORAL since 2015. So she's going to share some of her wisdom about OER and her talk is called Introduction to Open Educational Resources. Hi, um, so I'm going to introduce you to the concept of open educational resources. I don't know how many people already know what those are or anything. Does anyone think that they can define open educational resources? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's kind of like a free teachers pay teachers where <laughs> ever where you can create something that's to be used in the classroom or other teachers create it and it's and then you put it out there to share and you give permission for other teachers to utilize it in their classrooms. Okay. That's pretty good, actually. Yeah, that's <laughs> better than some definitions I've heard, for sure. Um, okay, great. So thank you for taking a stab at it. Um, so I'll give you a little more details about the ideas. And so, yeah, you said something about sharing and permissions, and those are really important things. So I'm really glad that you mentioned those. And free also is important, but um, that's not that's a good thing, but it's not the only part of open educational resources. So um, I'm just going to give you a little introduction to CORAL first, although we've talked about it before. So CORAL is one of 16 national foreign language resource centers in the country. Um, and we're funded by a grant from the Department of Education. It's a Title VI grant, and so Title VI just covers all of the different international education. Um, and so the, the, the National Heritage Language Resource Center that uh, I think Gabriela mentioned earlier is one of the other centers, and there's a lot of other centers too that have a lot of good offerings, and we have a brochure about those in your, um, in your folder, so you can check those out as well. And we're located at the University of Texas at Austin, obviously, and we're the only center focused on open educational resources for language learning. So that's, the other centers have different, different foci, but our focus is only OER for language learning. And so CORAL, uh, you've heard us say this acronym already. So CORAL is the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning. So uh, our logo is this, so you can see OER is a really important part of our logo. Uh, so just to go deeper into the definition of open educational resources, um, and our definition here, there's a lot of different definitions, is educational material offered freely for anyone to use involving a combination of the following permissions. Retain, um, so that means there's no expiring passwords. You can keep things for as long as you want. You can download them. Uh, reuse, so you can reuse them as many times as you want and you don't have to worry about violating copyright with that. You can redistribute, so you share them with the community, you can share them with your students, you can share them with your colleagues. Remix, so you can take different materials that you like and put them together, and revise, that's really important. So um, it's helpful for open educational resources to be in editable formats, like. Google Docs or something, so you can make changes to it. And even something like the template that you were working on earlier, filling out about your programs, that would be in OER because you can, it's, it's sort of a thing that you can modify for your own use. And so why are we talking about OER? Well, there's two main reasons. So the first reason is financial, and the second is pedagogical. Um, financially, I think I don't really have to explain to you that education isn't very well funded. Uh, this is just a, one of many charts showing how the prices of textbooks, that's the dark blue line, have gone up much faster than prices of other consumer items. So, um, and a lot of, Surveys have shown that students will choose not to take a class because the book is too expensive or they won't buy the book and they'll, they'll get a worse grade because of it. So that's a major problem in, in higher ed and in, in K-12. But then the really important reason is pedagogical. And I think that's the reason people don't always focus on as much. So we talk about resources being free or low cost, but the pedagogical benefits are, are really incredible and especially for 
um, languages like heritage teaching, where as Gabriella kept saying in her presentation, it's so important that, um, that you really teach according to your specific students and how uh, you have to sort of emphasize the differences between your students. And those can't, that can't really be done with a traditional textbook, with one traditional textbook. You need a lot of different sources for doing that. And OER help with that because you can get things from different places, you can adapt them, so you can really, you can really make something that's appropriate for you, your students. Uh, so I'm gonna show you this quick video about describing OER in a nutshell, just 30 seconds or a minute. Traditional language textbooks are limiting. With no way to customize them, teachers can feel stuck. We're here to tell you about open educational resources. An OER is any material shared by its creator that has a Creative Commons or other open license and is available at low to no cost. While traditional textbooks have a copyright, preventing you from making copies or modifications, OERs allow you to remix, revise, and reuse <laughs> material, creatively adapting your resources and sharing them with language teachers and classrooms all over the world. Come, explore this new pedagogical landscape and open up your resources and your classroom. Okay, so hopefully that just emphasizes what I was just talking about. And as an example, another example of open educational resources. So in that video, there was um, someone took, took a lesson from the internet and modified it. And the lesson was actually one that was written by uh, our other presenters, Yanina and Jose Esteban. So, um, and, and their materials are Creative Commons licensed. So we're allowed to, to use that in our video and to make changes to it. And other teachers can, can make changes as well and use them in their classroom. And so, so the video also mentioned copyright, and that's a really important aspect of this whole thing. So open educational resources have, do not have a copyright, or they do have a copyright, but there's another license on top of that, which gives, gives the people using the materials more rights than they would normally have. Um, so with copyright, you can see on the left, the publisher has all these different rights over the materials, and the user doesn't have hardly any rights. So the publisher can copy the materials, they can distribute copies, they can make derivatives, they can make changes, and they can sell the original materials or they can sell the changes that they've made. But a user, they can only buy one copy and then use that one copy for themselves. So you can see that there's really a big disparity between the person creating the materials and the person using the materials. But then with open educational resources, we use Creative Commons licenses. And these give, so this allows the publishers, the authors, and the users to share the rights more. So uh, the publishers and the authors can choose which rights they want to keep for themselves and which rights they want to give away to the people using the materials. And um, so you can see here, there's, there's a lot of different Creative Commons licenses, and this is kind of complicated at first. So uh, the, the main thing to remember, this is kind of the most simple Creative Commons license. CC BY, so when you see that, it means that you can make copies of the materials, you can make changes to the materials, you can share the materials, you can even sell the materials uh, without violating copyright as long as you give credit to the person who, who made the original materials. And then uh, there's all different licenses that have different restrictions. Uh, so for example, if you see this symbol right here, that means you cannot sell the materials. If you see this, materi this, this symbol, that means you can't uh, change the materials. And if you see this symbol, that basically means you have to, uh, you can share the materials, but you have to share them with this, the same license. So you can just see here that this gives authors a lot of freedom to decide how they want people to use the things that they create. <coughs> And so basically, copyright is all rights reserved. It's one C in the circle. And Creative Commons is some rights reserved, two Cs in a circle. So you're reserving some of the rights when you create uh, open educational resources, and you're giving some of the rights to the people using the materials. And so uh, this concept of free, when we talk about open educational resources being free, it's sort of uh, 
different definitions of free. Uh, so, so both definitions, the gratis version and the libre version, are both applicable. But um, what we're really talking about more is the libre version. So you're free, you have the freedom to use these materials. The author has the freedom to share the materials with other people. So it's really not just about the free cost or the low cost. It's about the freedom to use materials in a lot of different ways. So I have a few, just so you can kind of concept, conceptualize what I'm talking about, I have a few examples of open educational resources that I'll, I'll go through. And uh, these aren't all Spanish examples, but it's just to show you an idea of what can be an open educational resource and what is out there. So uh, the first one actually is a Spanish example. An OER can be an activity. So this is an activity that people actually at, our, at this workshop two years ago wrote, and then we posted it on the website afterwards. So these are just regular high school teachers who created this material, and now it's av available for other people to use, and it has a Creative Commons license on the bottom. And an OER can also be a lesson or a unit plan. It can be curricula. It can be a course. It can be a, syllabi, a syllabus or a syllabi. It can be a podcast. It can be a tool. It can be a, a full textbook. It can be a story. So this is a collection of stories from in Indian languages. It can be videos. It can be professional development. So it's not just for students, but it's for teachers as well. Or it can be a wiki. And the list goes on. So basically, anything you use in your classroom that has a Creative Commons license on it is an open educational resource. And so just uh, so you get an idea of how you can find these resources, I hope that you will kind of try to explore them a little bit if you haven't already, because there's a lot out there. So you can search for authentic materials. Authentic materials can be open educational resources, or you can search for already for lessons that have already been created um, by other teachers that you can use or modify. So one way to search for authentic resources, like images, audios, video, and texts, is on CC Search. So uh, you can go there by typing in search.creativecommons.org. And so this website sort of combines all the, different, all the different websites that have images and texts and video. So you type in your search query here, and then you get results from all of these different websites, like Flickr, or Wikimedia, or YouTube. And all of the results have Creative Commons licenses on them. So this is just an easy way. You don't have to go to YouTube to look for a video or to Flickr. You can just type, look in all of those different places at once with this search. And this is provided by, the, by Creative Commons, which is the organization that creates the Creative Commons licenses. And then, um, oh yeah, so this is just an example of all the different all the different resources available on these platforms. So I'm sure you all already use YouTube or, or Flickr or websites like that to find things for your own purposes or for your classroom. But there's actually a lot. But in YouTube and on Flickr and all those places, um, there are copyrighted materials and there are Creative Commons licenses, licensed materials. And they're all together. And they're all labeled. But I think a lot of times we don't really look at the labels or the license on the materials. We just use them. But um, there's a lot of Creative Commons materials on these places. So for example, Flickr has 4. 415 million openly licensed Creative Commons licensed images. And YouTube has 49 million Creative Commons licensed videos. So that's really a lot of videos. And a lot of them are in other languages besides English. So here's an example. If you search on Flickr, if you type in a search term like graffiti, uh, you get all these images. And then up at the top, you can filter for Creative Commons, so where I highlighted in yellow up there. So you can choose what Creative Commons license you want. But if you click on that, you know that you can reuse all of these images without violating copyright or anything. And then once you click on an image, this is where you see the license on Flickr. So it's right under the image. And then this is the author's name. So you, know, so you see the license here, and you know that you have to attribute the image to that person if you re reuse it. And here's another example. On YouTube, you can just type in a search term and click filter up at the top right. 
and choose Creative Commons, and then all of these videos are available for you to use as long as you give credit to the, to the original creator. And so then you can also search for materials on repositories. So these are materials that have already been created by other people, and you can find them and adapt them for your own purposes. Uh, so we have a guide on Coral's blog about finding these. And then there's also a few websites we recommend. So Merlot is really useful because it has a lot of materials for language learning, and there's a lot of different search terms you can use for language learning. So you can even search by proficiency level and um, by what language and things like that. So there's a lot of options. So that's at www.merlot.org. And then other options are OER Commons or the LRC website. So that's the website that all the different national language resource centers in the country share, where we all post our, our materials. And so here's just an example on Merlot of a, of a material that's posted. So one of the interesting things about that is that you can see on the top right corner, it says peer reviews and user ratings and comments. So this is kind of highlighting an important part of open educational resources, which is um, the fact that people can talk about materials and share materials. So it's not really just like there's this lesson floating out there on the internet. You can see what you can see if other people have used it. You can talk about the materials with each other, and you can also verify that this is of high quality because I know there's a lot of things out there online, and they're not always high quality. So ratings kind of help you discover what what's the best quality. And then also on Coral's website, we have a lot of different materials. So we have a lot of Spanish things. This is just um, an example of how you can find Spanish resources on our website. You can go to materials up there at the top and choose Spanish. And we have a bunch of different things. And we'll be adding a lot more things. Hopefully, if we, if we get our grant for the next grant cycle, we have a lot more Spanish projects in the works. So uh, just to talk about some benefits of open educational resources, I'm going to show you some quotes from people who have used them. But first, I just wanted to show you um, as an example that people are using open educational resources a lot. I wanted to show you another website that Coral has. So this is the Language OER Network. And this shows all the different people who use OER or who have, who have taught with OER, who have created it or who just who promote it to their colleagues. So you can see, and this isn't even really an exhaustive list. This is just some people we know. But all of these people have used OER. And you can even you can click on their, on their name and see what they've done. So it's cool to see all the different projects that people are working on that uh, are available for you to use. Uh, OK, so to, to go back to the benefits, I think we've already talked about being able to use things without restrictions and the price. But then there's also other benefits, too. Um, so for, oh, wait, we started at the very beginning. OK, so for example, this is um, Megan Schacht from Missouri. She's a high school teacher, a world languages coordinator. And she pointed, she has started using open educational resources, replacing her textbook with OER. And she's noticed that it's been easier to, to keep with a 90% target language use in her classroom um, using OER because there's a lot more authentic materials. So she can expose her students to a lot more uh, culturally relevant material and a lot more authentic language. And another benefit is you can gain more visibility for your work. So this is a quote from uh, Ignacio Carvajal, who is at the University of Texas and worked on a Quiche project. So Quiche is a Mayan language of Guatemala. And we made some language learning materials for that language. Um, and just in a year or so, those, uh, they posted videos on YouTube and got 75,000 views. So you can see that like, it's, a, uh, it's a language that's spoken by a million people. But a lot of people are looking at those videos because they're out there on YouTube. And there aren't many similar videos. So you can really get exposure for your work. And you can, uh, it's, a, it's a nice way for people to be able to use what you're creating. And this is Saomi Tsai. So she wrote a lesson, a Chinese lesson on one of our websites. And she points out that you can really get idea, 
new ideas as part of a community with OER. So even if you don't use, a, if, you, if you find a lesson or an activity online, and even if you don't use it, you can still get ideas from it. You can get inspired by what other people are doing. So it's a really good way to share things in a community. And of course, you can also reduce costs for your students. So um, uh, Irene Fernandez Palacios from North Shore Community College created a whole new textbook for her students. She was teaching uh, elementary Spanish one for the health professions. And she created a whole new textbook for her students that was an open educational resource. And she saved her students a lot of money because they didn't have to buy a textbook. Um, so these are all benefits. Uh, of OER, but um, I've been talking a lot about materials, and I just wanted to point out at the end of this presentation that uh, OER is not just about materials, but there's a whole open education movement that's more about practices as well, and I think everyone here is practicing this already, as you're all being open educators, first by being here and just sharing your ideas with people. So everyone's shared ideas already with things they've done in their classroom, and that alone in itself is is also an open educational practice because there's a really important community element that goes along with open education. And let's see. OK, so these are just some open educational practices, uh, sharing, adapting materials, collaborating, mentoring, innovating, experimenting, researching, empowering students and showing gratitude. So these are all just little things you can do. Um, for example, with the empowering students, a lot of people um, have their students create their own resources. So their students will create lessons for, the, for students in another class or for the students in the next class. Um, so that's just a cool example of being an open educator. Um, and then like f showing gratitude, I think the, the attribution part of the Creative Commons license is really important because you can you can use people's ideas and then you can thank them for their ideas and I think so there's a lot of there's a lot of um, mutual appreciation that goes along with it and so these are just some ways that you can be open in your in your educational practices you can share an idea with a colleague you can join a community such as our heritage Spanish website which Joselli will be talking about later uh, you can try putting a CC license on something that you create you can search re repositories like Merlot for content for your class, and you can have your students create their own learning materials. So these are just all like small things you can do to start getting into open educational resources and getting into open education. How do you do the put a CC license? Uh, well, we can. I can show you quickly. So the Creative Commons website has the licenses on the website. So you can basically just copy and paste the license on there, but I'll show you. OK, so if you're on the website and you do share your work and then go down to licensing types, I think that should. Uh, yeah, you can find the licenses there. So like it gives you, it explains the terms, and then you have to scroll to the bottom and say use the license. I think there's an easier way to do it, but this is. Oh, yeah, that's true. OK. Yeah, that's better, actually. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, so this tells you, you answer the questions about what you want, what the terms of the license are. So allow adaptations, yes. Allow commercial uses, you can say no. And then it gives you the license. Uh, and then, yeah, and then you can just copy and paste this part into your document. Or if you have a website, you can copy and paste this text. And then these are all the images I used in, in the presentation just to keep with the open educational attribution. So are there any questions? Yes. I have two. OK. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One might be really easy and quick, hopefully. The other, maybe not. So first, uh -huh. 
on the non-commercial um, category of, uh, yeah, what a, does that include like a photocopy packet where I'm not, where I'm just, I'm not making right. any profit on it. It's our, our department charges four cents a copy, so, and yeah. we just put it in a photocopy packet. Is that considered? Would that be breaking the non-commercial part of that? Uh, I think if you're not, I don't know, that might be a little bit dodgy, but I think it's okay because there was a lawsuit recently where um, the like Kinko's or something was making copies for a school district and then someone sued them and Kinko's won because they were just, they weren't making money, or I guess they were making money off of it, but they weren't really like selling the materials, they were just doing their job and making the copies. So I. I think that would be okay, but okay. it might be a little bit. But I mean, I, th I think it, uh, something with OER is that m sometimes it just helps to contact the person who made it and ask them if it's okay. And I, f I feel like they would probably say yes because you're not your school and you're not yeah. making a profit. Okay, but so th the next question yeah. is, okay, now here I am, I'm looking for good materials. Um, how do I go and how is this organized? How am I going to find something that's going to be useful? Well, there. So you can go on those repositories that I I showed you. Um, is that on, are they on this? Oof, this handout thing. Those are all Corals materials. So that's yeah, that's a good place to start. So those are all the materials that we've created here at the at Coral at the University of Texas. But uh, if you want to find things by other people, then those re repositories I showed you are a good place to start. So uh, yeah, so, so like, search.creativecommons.org. Yeah, and then also Merlot is this website and OER Commons. Um, I can maybe uh, I can send out the links somehow. Yeah, I can share the PowerPoint. Okay, so I'll put the. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll put the PowerPoint on the drive, and then you can see the links. I don't have the links to all the repositories, so maybe I'll add the links to the other repositories, and then put the presentation up there, so you can look at my presentation. And when you look at it, is it easy to see? Oh, here's Spanish, and then you, there's more um, advanced Spanish yeah. videos. How is it? Well, it kind of depends. Go and see? It depends on where you're looking. Uh, so, for example, on OER Commons, I think, yeah, so you can type in a oh, lesson, but I don't know, you probably use a better search term than that, but then you can choose the subject and the level. Okay, in the standards there's no, so I'm not sure. Yeah, so then it comes up with a bunch of things, and then you can drill down by language. And is there a way to do specific language? No. So yeah, this is not this is not ideal, <laughs> but that's why I suggested Merlot because you can search by the language, and I think that's way more useful. Um, so there's even, I think there's a place, for, I, they just changed this interface. So it's not, it doesn't look like it looked before. But yeah, there's a place here where you can search by language. So I think that's better. Although there's also, I think there's a better way to do it. Oh yeah, you can select by discipline and then humanities and then subdiscipline and then world languages. And then you can search. Yeah, so that's a better way to do it. And then all this stuff comes up, but then you can filter by like whether it's a website or a PDF or what the license is or what level it is. And I think in the original search, you could also search by lesson 
or activity or something like that so you could get more granular with but the but each repository is going to have its own way of finding stuff yeah okay thank you My question has to do with how you reference the material. Uh -huh. um, how do you show credit? So you That's borrow somebody's video uh -huh. or their image, then do you just, what does it look like? Are you just copying the, the CC? Yeah. Is, so does APA have a special format for CC material? There's not, so Creative Commons on their blog, they have advice about how to do it, but there's not really one format for it. It's sort of, everyone does it differently, which is a little bit weird. But usually they say title, author, source, and license. So you would say, you would say this image is from this author, I found it here, and it has this license on it. That was in yeah. your work cited. So if you wanted just to show the image, you know, you know, I guess if we're ever dealing with copyright material, and you had permission to use it, then you could you know, put the little C with the last name and a year or something to show that your material was created you know, at that time. Is it gonna work the same way with Creative Commons? Yeah, I don't think, yeah, I, I don't think you have to put the year necessarily, but yeah, it's basically the same, just as long as you also list the license. And I noticed, was it on um, the website before this one where it showed a list of activities that there were each activity had a rating. Is it, is it similar like the, an Amazon product where you can give it so many stars and you got so many ratings? And yeah, that's, I mean, not all repositories have that, but most repositories do have that, the rating system. And you can submit comments and things like that. So yeah, you can filter out the things that have been rated badly. Okay, thanks. Yep. Are there any more questions? And if not, so Barbara Sahil is um, here, and she had so she's she already wrote a book about using open educational resources in the language classroom, and um, she's working on a new book, and so she wanted to, to talk to you about that quickly, and also um, some another project she's working on, and these are just examples of other open projects for you. So um, we. Um, I was uh, fortunate to be one of three editors of a book um, that, um, and I, I should preface my comments by saying that this is not just a movement that happens here in the United States, it's happening all around the world. Um, I uh, had the good fortune of attending a conference in Bologna, Italy, uh, sponsored by Eurocall. Um, the, uh, I don't even know what the acronym means, but um, essentially myself and a woman from the Open University and a woman from the University of Bologna got together and thought it would be really nice to be able to showcase people's work using open educational resources or open educational practices, whatever that means. It could mean a MOOC, it could mean a tool, similar to what Sarah was saying, that it, 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 it defies description, it can mean all things and many things. What I'll do is put up on um, in the resource bank, in the Google folder, um, a link to the, the book that we created last uh, five years ago. It's simply a book of case studies it's meant not. It's not meant to be a highly academic, um, you know, highly researched um, uh, doc series of documents. They're meant to be a series of brief case studies, in which practitioners can go in and say, "Ooh, this looks interesting. These are really wonderful outcomes. Here are the nuts and bolts of how to do this," um, and be able to contact the person um, for more information. Um, the book is completely open. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's right there. It's completely open. Um, so if you want to click on that, the first link there, you can download all of the chapters. We received no money for doing this. All we did was help curate it and pull things together. Um, so it's all completely downloadable, um, searchable, queryable, all of those things. But there are people from all over the world who wanted to share their stories of what they did with open practices, resources, websites, tools, etc. This was so successful um, and got really good feedback that we're doing another one. So if there's something you are particularly fond of that you're using in your classroom that would quantify as being open, 
um, I would love to talk with you, and I can put up some information on, on the call for proposals. Again, these are not um, meant to be uh, what I sort of call highfalutin academic papers. These are meant to be case studies of practical uses of these tools in the classroom with the idea of sharing them with your colleagues, with your friends from around the world. I think uh, the downloads for this were for everywhere, from Africa, Asia, all over. Um, and it's, it's, been, um, it's been a really great resource. So if you're interested in participating, please let me know. I'll put up more information on the Google Docs site. The last thing I want to say is my other, one of the other hats I wear, because we all wear many hats, I'm the Spanish language education coordinator for, coordinator for the NPR podcast Radio Ambulante. And I would love to um, talk with any of you who have used Radio Ambulante in your classrooms. Um, the content of, a little bit different, the content of Radio Ambulante is copywritten. Uh, the podcasts themselves cannot be changed. But what we've discovered in the five or six years I've been working with the team is the, the variety and the wealth of, of materials that teachers are creating on their own in, in their classrooms for their students and how brilliant these materials are and how so many other teachers would benefit from that hard work. Um, we, Sarah and I were talking about sometimes um, uh, people outside of our institutions appreciate our work more than our own colleagues do. Um, and, and this would be an opportunity, if you have done work with Radio Ambulante, if you have introduced it to your students, especially with heritage speakers, um, I would love to talk with you some more. We're thinking about the idea of creating an open repository of those materials. Uh, I know it is very popular on Teachers Pay Teachers. I personally have a problem with teachers pay teachers because you can't always see what the materials are. Sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not so great. This, the whole idea here, would you would get total credit and all of your work would be available um, to, for other teachers to use as well. So I'll put information up about the, the book, um, about the case studies book, and we would love to have people um, participate in that. But I'll also make sure that my information's out there that if you do use Radio Ambulante in the classroom, I would love to talk with you some more. Thank you. All right, so now Giselle is going to introduce the Heritage Spanish website. <coughs> and you already have the mic and everything, right? Okay. Am I on? Yes. So uh, thank you, Sarah, for showing us all about OER. And now I'd like to show you guys so the point of coming to this workshop is getting a lot of resources that you can use, take home with you, right? So I'm going to show you more specifically what we have, what Coral has to offer for Spanish teachers. And I was going to only show you the um, Heritage Spanish website, but I decided two minutes ago <laughs> that um, I want to show you some of the other resources that Coral has for Spanish teachers. Because I recently gave a workshop about spin text, which is one of our big things, um, one of our big projects, and teachers loved it. So I thought maybe I'd just quickly show you what we have. So uh, if you go to, where is it where I can find the languages? So we have all these languages, ah. right? And so we're going to go to Spanish. So you can see everything that we have. And so there's different projects that you can look through, and uh, Español Abierto, Introduction to Proficiency Levels. We have um, the Spanish Proficiency Exercises, which is, I don't know how many of you are, have used this website before, but it's these videos. They're very old now, it's, <laughs> but we keep using them. And people all over the country tell me, oh, yeah, I know you guys. You have those videos with the speakers from all over the world. I use them all the time. They, they're still great. So if you don't know this, then check out our website, and all these are open resources you can use. But then I wanted to point out uh, Spintex, which is uh, the Spanish in Texas corpus. And this is a big project that was created by uh, professors uh, Declan Toribio and Barbara Bullock. They started working with a lot of uh, grad students who went, they got trained, and they went out and interviewed people all over Texas to have a record of what Spanish in Texas is like. So uh, it's a big project with um, a video archive, then a website of Spanish grammar in context, which basically teaches grammar concepts using examples from these videos. And in the video archive, it can be a great source for research, 
but also for teachers because you have these speakers who are not necessarily from one type of Spanish, but really the Spanish that is spoken in Texas comes from everywhere, right? You have people who moved here from other places, people who grew up here, there's a wide variety. So we have all these videos, which are a really great resource, and um, lots of different topics, and you can search by language features, like if you wanna uh, teach possessives, or deseos, or expresar agradecimiento, uh, it's all tagged. And then you have by speaker, so you can you have all these speakers, and if you wanna use only people who are from a certain place in the state, and once you find a video, People love to see this. So if you open a video, and for example, you're gonna show, you have the transcript, which you can hide or show for their students. And if you wanna focus on uh, imperfecto, so I wanna hide all the verbs that are imperfect and have the students fill them out, for example. And there's a lot you can do with this. So I'm just giving you a quick glimpse of it so you can go and explore it on your own. But for now, now what I was supposed to talk about is the Heritage Spanish website, which is the project that we are very proud of because it's not just a website. This is the website where I showed you where you could go and find our resources. It's a community. And now that you're here, you're all part of this community. So what is the purpose of the website? So if we can see here on the main page, Un espacio para los instructores de español que quieran colaborar, compartir y comunicarse con otros sobre la enseñanza y el aprendizaje del español como lengua de herencia. So if you found yourself searching for, adapting, or creating materials for your heritage classes because of a lack of readily available commercial resources, this site is for you. So there's uh, different things you can do here. You can have a conversation with other instructors about anything that would be relevant for heritage Spanish instruction. You can share resources, you can find a bunch of resources and stay up to date on new events and uh, things that would be interesting for any teachers of Heritage Spanish at any level. So I'm gonna kind of go over um, the different things we have on the website so you can see. We have this message board where you can go and ask a question and hopefully somebody will have the answer for you or comments, right? So this is a great place to just get started if you are wondering, oh, how do you teach this particular topic to heritage students, for example? And so it, I invite all of you to register for this forum, and the way you do that is you go here, register, and you can write all your information, and then it'll send you an email, and then you can click on that email and verify your account. So it's great because, uh, so all the people who are already members have filled out their profiles, and you can go on here and read about them if the computer cooperates with me. Well, you can click there, and it'll show you uh, the profiles of all the people who are teaching Spanish for heritage learners all over the country <coughs> at different levels. So, okay, I'm gonna skip over the participate, and I'm gonna show you uh, some of the resources we have. So for example, we created this page, uh, Current Affairs, where we started putting materials that would be useful to support undocumented students in the recent year where this has become more relevant. So that's uh, the kind of thing that we can post here. If there's ever anything you wanna share that you think is relevant that would help other instructors, just send it to us and we will share it. We have uh, classroom activities. And I don't know if you've heard of the Coral Collaborators Program, but Coral gives small grants to collaborators who, are, who want to create material. And these uh, three activities you see at the top were from last year's workshop a year ago. After the workshop, there was a call sent out for collaborators and people applied and those who got selected, they worked for the year on a project that they would like to create and share and they got a small grant to work on this, and now they're ready. And so these are all open resources that you can use. And for example, we have one about graffiti, el arte urbano hispanoamericano, and there's a collection of videos that a teacher here in Austin created that she filmed children, heritage learners who are children, 
because she felt the need for videos, not just of grown-ups speaking Spanish, but children themselves speaking Spanish, to be models for the kids that she was teaching. So that's, if you teach uh, kids, that would be a really great resource. Um, then we have a collection of activities by uh, Claudia Alguín Mendoza and her team at the University of Oregon. And it's a great collection of activities based on critical pedagogies. I invite you to look at it and you might want to use it. We have uh, a whole curriculum that was developed for a community college. And then we have all the activities that have been created by Esteban and Janine Hernandez and their team at UT Rio Grande Valley. And they're going to talk more about those tomorrow, but now you know where to find them. And so on. We have more activities there that you can use. We have a list of textbooks, that commercial textbooks, if you want to browse. Program profiles. This is where we are hoping to have a list of the different Heritage Spanish profiles of programs around the country. So if you have a program and it's not on here, we'd love for you to send us a short description so we can add it to the list. Um, what else? Interesting articles. We ha our section on assessments is very small. Everybody knows the problem with placement exams. And so we're trying to collect more information to share about placement exams. Then some more uh, research and pedagogy. Things that might be interesting to you. Resources from all over the country. Um, newspapers. Syllabi. And <laughs> this, this section. Wouldn't it be great if we had a bank of syllabus, syllabi from all different places with different levels, different courses? So I'm trying to get people to share their syllabus so that we could post it. You put a Creative Commons license on it. So far we have three, and guess what? These are my three syllabi. <laughs> so uh, that's all you do is, you know, I'm going to show you how you put your, these are the three courses that we teach at UT for heritage learners. And, oh, okay. I just want to open the document. All you do is, okay, open it. That's my syllabus, and you put the Creative Commons license on there. And now this is an open resource. So you can go and look at my syllabus, and you, know, you might like a couple things from there and want to integrate them to your own, or see kind of what kind of topics we cover at the University of Texas and think about what you want to do for your own syllabus, right? So if we had many more, then you know, all the better, right? So that's something that we're trying to grow. And like, this is a, a community that's still growing. So we have a list of other websites that might be useful for you. And uh, finally, our events page, which is, this is where we are. We are sold out. Um, but if you have any events that are coming up that you think would be of interest to the community, we would love to hear from you and we will share it because there are a lot of people who go on here and find out about events on our website. So it would be a great place to promote your event. And finally, I want to go back to the participate section because this is what we want you to do. We want you to participate. So the purpose of the website is to have a space where we can all share. It's not like a couple of us are going to create all this stuff for the world because nobody has time for that, right? But if we all do a small part and add it to our repository, then we would have a big, rich place where we can go and look for materials. So if you have any resources that you would like to share under a Creative Commons license, just send it to us. We will look at it. We can give you feedback. Then we might you know, ask you to make some changes, or we might say, this is great. Just put the Creative license on it, and we'll share it on the website, and then it'll be open. So uh, that is the only way that our community will grow, is if more people participate and more people create their own materials. So um, I want to finish up by saying, like I said, it's not a website, it's a community. And it was recently, a couple of weeks, uh, months ago, Open Education Week, and we were celebrate, celebrating here, I guess. And um, I was asked to write a short blog post for the UT libraries. And I'm going to just read a little bit of what I wrote, which is going to conclude kind of our day. So throughout the country, Spanish instructors at all levels are forming programs, creating materials to serve heritage Spanish learners. And it seems that we all have some common goals. To help heritage Spanish speakers develop their bilingual skills, 
to empower them to apply those skills in academic and professional settings, and to feel proud of their cultural and linguistic heritage. So if we all have similar goals, and we're all working on creating programs and materials to serve those students, why not share the work we're doing, right? So I, I have been able to share some of my work and see and hear about other people using it in other parts of the country, and that's really rewarding. And I believe if we all collaborate and if we all uh, share openly, then we'll be more successful in achieving our own goals, and, but also our common goals. So I'm going to finish there, and if you have any questions about the community, the website, or anything, I'm happy to answer. No? So is everybody going to go and sign on right now? Yes? Okay. <laughs>